Huawei is one of the most evil companies in the world and is quite possibly one of the greatest threats to our society. And yet, you probably know nothing about this company. And if you do see it advertised, you probably just think it's a normal big company like Samsung or Apple. But this couldn't be any further from the truth. Because in the span of just a few years, Huawei has become the largest telecommunications company in the world, with the company recently replacing Apple as the second largest smartphone manufacturer in the world, generating over $100 billion a year. It seems like this is just because their products are good, with their phones being cheap, reliable and having a slick build. But when you start looking into this more, you start to think, how is this actually possible? The telecommunications industry is completely saturated, and the mobile phone market is almost impossible to break into. But Huawei has somehow managed to take over the industry by storm. So doesn't this seem just a little too perfect? Well, that's because it is. In fact, there's a very, very disturbing reason they've been so successful, and it's the reason that governments around the world are doing everything they can to stop this company from growing. And the first part of this reason lies in how Huawei was created in the first place. You see, Huawei's past goes as far back as the 1980s. Reng Xingfei, a former army engineer, founded the telecommunication firm using only a relatively meager $5,000. Despite the low amount of initial funding, Huawei wouldn't be small for long. The company began making specific parts for the largely foreign-made Chinese infrastructure, along with reverse engineering and sometimes outright stealing other people's technology to fuel China's ever-expanding tech industry. And so, within just a few years, Huawei was a prominent a new company with over 500 researchers all working towards establishing their technological dominance in China. But this ambition from Huawei didn't go unnoticed. In fact, the Chinese government had seen the company's potential very, very early on. They were always keeping an eye. Because during this period, China was a nation that was rapidly on the rise. They had been steadily recovering from the many pitfalls they had during the 20th century. Because China had been long following the 2049 plan, an endgame for the country that was proposed by the ruthless dictator Mao. You see, Mao was like Stalin and Hitler. He dreamed of a China that would take back its supposedly rightful place at the top of the world in what they called the quote, the national rejuvenation dream. And China wasn't going to accomplish this goal by staying isolated. They would have to start further exerting power beyond their borders. In order to become the number one superpower, China would have to gain significant leverage over all other nations in the world. However, a plan like this can't rely on strictly military operations. Rather, if China could control the major technologies of the world and the infrastructure that went with it, they'd be unstoppable because this is what made America so powerful. And if they could take the soft power from America, China would become the world's superpower. The only question that remained was how China was going to accomplish this tall order, since the country was lagging incredibly far behind in their tech developments. I mean, just 30 years ago, they were an entirely impoverished nation, a communist third world hellhole, so they needed to start competing with the West. And their first step to do this was to begin emulating some capitalist policies borrowed from the West. Once China managed to pull themselves out of this poverty, the country slowly began adopting a new kind of regime that stepped away from Mao's policies. To speed up Mao's 2049 plans, China would embrace an efficient blend of capitalism and communism. Trade and industry were allowed to thrive all under the watchful eye of the state. And the corporations that enticed China the most, both in current growth and potential control, was the blooming tech companies. Which isn't all that surprising given that controlling technology allows for control of information. And as the old adage goes, knowledge is power. Knowledge gives China enormous leverage over everyone. And when the CCP realized the potential of technology companies like Huawei, they didn't hesitate to capitalize on it. Which is why it didn't take very long for Huawei to be completely owned by the Chinese government and Huawei's leadership structure reflects this. You see, if you try to look into Huawei's leadership, it's intentionally left opaque. And technically, the employees are the ones who actually own Huawei. It's a perfect communist company. However, like in communism, workers have no way to actually influence the decisions made at the top. Instead, this lies with an unelected board of executives, some of which come directly from the inner communist party. Ray, the founder of Huawei, only owns 1% of the company himself. And it's argued from the start that Huawei was always a CCP project. Because alongside their ownership stake, the CCP CCP has invested over $75 billion in government subsidies and tax cuts to Huawei alone. But more than that, Huawei, like almost every other major Chinese company, must submit to the Chinese government, as China's government has quite the history of treating people who defy them rather unkindly, no matter what their net worth is. Jack Ma is probably the first one that comes to mind. After the CEO of Alibaba fell out of favor with some powerful officials, he was forced to step down from his chairmanship from the Alibaba group. And to put into perspective, at the height of his power, Ma was the fifth richest person in China and had a net worth over $37 billion. But after criticizing the country's draconian control of their markets, he was essentially unpersoned by the government. The mystery now surrounding tech tycoon Jack Ma. 
The billionaire founder of China's giant online retailer Alibaba has not been seen in public since October when he blasted Chinese regulators in a speech that drew fire from China's leaders. Despite the seemingly harsh outcome, others have had it way, way worse. Reng Kang, a renowned critic of Xi Jinping, published an essay in 2019 calling him a clown, among many other various denunciations. Ren also happened to be a very well-known Chinese business tycoon, with huge economic influence. However, only a few days after his criticism, he mysteriously disappeared, and then only reappeared later in Chinese court, where he was quickly sentenced to 18 years in prison for corruption. And his story mirrors that of Xiao Jianha, a Chinese-Canadian billionaire who lived in Hong Kong. Despite his history of support for the CCP during the unrest and his numerous contributions to the state, he upset the wrong people, and he ended up being kidnapped in 2017 by plainclothes Chinese police officers in broad daylight. At the time, they didn't have jurisdiction in Hong Kong, but this didn't matter, and from there he went missing for years, presumably deported to the mainland. He only turned up again in August of 2022, this time in another courtroom. Accused of bribery, Xiao was sentenced to 13 years, and even with his close connections with high-up members in the CCP, neither this or his immense wealth could save him. And of course, it's not just just billionaires. So if you're running a huge company like Huawei, you're gonna do as the Chinese government says. Especially as the benefits of the growing tech industry were becoming more and more clear to the CCP. The main benefit being soft power. China wants to invest in these companies because they know it's the way of the future. Wars are already being fought in cyberspace, so why do you think China built themselves another great war in the digital sphere? And that's only one part of China's internet framework. The first task the CCP assigned to Huawei was to expand upon China's technological infrastructure, and they did so in the space of just a few short years. Through a series of lucrative government contracts, Huawei made China a state-of-the-art telecommunications system, and as the world's technological developments progressed further and further, China would use Huawei to expand their power abroad as well. In addition to keeping domestic operations under control, Beijing also wanted Huawei to help with their mission of international expansion. Under the guidance of the CCP, Huawei would grow massively throughout the 90s and well into the early 2000s. The company built infrastructure throughout the vast regions of China, which helped to modernize the nation. But Huawei also piled their trade abroad, and this was the next part of their 2049 plan. If they were going to become a developed economy, they would going to need a lot more resources, and China sees that in Africa. Africa's population of 1.1 billion people is expected to double by then, and the continent's rich natural resources already fuel China's economy. But China still needs to keep some sort of control if they're not going to occupy the countries themselves, and this comes from technology as well. See, they built the infrastructure across the world, but put a particular focus on Africa and the Middle East. There, Huawei would build technological infrastructure both for dictatorships and democracies alike. Anyone and everyone would become dependent on China. China, which meant through China's growing technological dominance, China would then gain more soft power. Which is why over 70% of Africa's 4G infrastructure has been built by Huawei. Now it's important to note that control of this infrastructure and the data that comes from it gives China massive leverage over Africa. And on top of this, every country that has Chinese made infrastructure and makes deals with these Chinese companies is one less country making deals with the West. And by using Huawei as a secondary option for developing countries, China has expanded their soft power across the globe. But Huawei's meteoric rise did have a few bumps along the way. In order to grow as quickly as they did, they needed to produce much more more than just infrastructure. Huawei needed to become a giant capable of rivaling tech companies in the West. Before Huawei, Tencent and ByteDance, the West had a near complete monopoly on massive tech firms. But Huawei's entrance into the market has upset this established order, with billions of dollars that would have gone into Western hands going instead straight to Huawei, and by extent, the CCP. China invested in these companies so that they could undercut their foreign rivals, and in return these companies have given China their portion of the trillions that big tech makes every year. Tencent, Huawei, ByteDance, all all of these companies are crucial to the 2049 plan, and the data that comes from them gives China unprecedented intelligence about everything that goes on abroad. But how did they manage to break the Western monopoly in such a short period of time? Well, one way that Huawei got ahead was through industrial espionage, and this is one of the first reasons that Huawei became such a controversial company. You see, back in 2003, Cisco, an American competitor of Huawei's, accused the company of stealing the source code and the blueprints for many models of their routers and other IT products. Even taking the manuals along with them. Once made, Huawei's knockoffs weren't only identical, even the typos that Cisco made had been replicated. The evidence was as clear as could be, and the two companies came to a settlement out of court. It seemed like Cisco had won, however this was only a temporary victory. In response to being caught red-handed, Huawei would smear Cisco throughout China. The company painted Cisco as a large, multinational corporation that was picking on the smaller Chinese one, just another form of Western imperialism. Along with the mountain of negative press this garnered, the incident was also more ammunition for the CCP to keep foreign companies out of Chinese markets. 
because while they were giving billions to Huawei, the CCP was also making it much harder for Western tech companies to gain a foothold in the country. Why allow other companies to compete with Huawei if this is essentially a government-run company? And with China's population of over a billion, this allows China to hinder their competition. So it's no surprise that Cisco's ambitions fizzled out over the years. And even though by 2012, evidence finally surfaced that Huawei had actually stolen information, it didn't even matter by this point. But this would just be one of many, many allegations of corporate espionage coming from Huawei. For example, in 2004, an employee was caught copying confidential diagrams and blueprints at a tech conference. And over the next 10 years, a seemingly never-ending stream of accusations would surface. This shady behavior was merely one of the ways that Huawei grew to be so massive by exploiting their government protection to steal any kind of info or blueprints they could get their hands on, which massively speeded up their growth. And now that Huawei was getting big, they were ready to expand into other specialization areas. The first of which, unsurprisingly, being surveillance. You see, for years, China has looked to strengthen their control over the billion people living in China, and so mass surveillance is very appetizing for the CCP, which is why it's no surprise that Huawei made technology that assists in this practice, and still does to this day. The company has made countless different devices and technologies that assist the CCP with monitoring both domestic and foreign civilians, facial recognition, camera technology, voice profiling, you name it. But perhaps the greatest tool in Huawei's arsenal are their smartphones, the greatest mass surveillance device of all time. See, contrary to what you might initially think when you hear about something made in China, the quality of production in Huawei phones isn't really that bad. In fact, their physical devices are actually a bargain. Relative to the other choices of Apple or Android, Huawei is the much cheaper alternative. And despite this, the company is still able to manufacture phones with designs and technologies that are on par with their competition. Huawei has managed to find a middle ground in the market between the simplicity of Apple phones and the flexibility of Androids. And so all of this information makes it seem like Huawei should be the clear choice for general consumers. It's cheap, reliable, and a simple phone that doesn't cut any corners. And by doing this, Huawei is taking over the world. Everywhere you look, you'll find Huawei adverts and Huawei phones. However, when something seems too good to be true, that's usually because it is, and the downsides surrounding Huawei products are only just being revealed. Because the only way they were actually able to make these phones was through massive subsidies and incredibly low production costs. But it was this magic formula of the CCP's control, government subsidies, and incredibly cheap labor that Huawei is now threatening the Western tech monopoly. So why are they doing this? Well, like I mentioned, soft power is incredibly important to China. Because with the Chinese government's control of Huawei, they now have free reign to handle the company's operations however they want. Want. And now that they've become so saturated across the world, this allows the CCP to then view a Huawei user's phone data or track their location. In fact, there's nothing actually stopping them from doing so, even if the person doesn't live in China. And this massive control has given China what it's craved for years, surveillance over the world. Xiaomi, another Chinese technology company very similar to Huawei, has also fell under control of the CCP, which has given the Chinese government control of a fifth of the world's market for smartphones. And so on top of the billions and billions that these two companies make for the CCP, this is also giving them all the data that they could ever dream of, which is obviously a big problem when it comes to national security. And that's exactly why countries like the US and Japan have now completely banned Huawei products. Although by the time they did this, the company has still managed to gain a strong foothold in other places like Canada and the UK. But developed countries likely aren't even Huawei's top priority. Instead, they've kept their focus on developing nations, and more importantly, Africa. Now, as we mentioned before, Africa is central to China's 2049 ambition. And whilst they've taken over all of the continent's key infrastructure, they've now used Huawei to take over the mobile networks in Africa. The Digital Silk Road, as it's called, is almost entirely made in China. Digital Silk Road is the, basically the technology dimension of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and the Belt and Road Initiative, or the BRI for short, it's Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy vision. And so the Digital Silk Road includes a whole bunch of digital activities, everything from wireless networks to subsea cables to satellites to smart cities. And what all those things have in common is they're really the infrastructure of tomorrow. All those activities are often around us, but not very visible. With data centers and other tech initiatives all coming from companies that are obedient to the CCP. To give some context here, around 70% of African cellular networks are all operated by Huawei. And this isn't even including the other Chinese mobile companies who also offer services in Africa, like CTE and China Telecom. This enormous amount of data harvesting by China isn't just a theory either. The country implemented their own law in 2017, requiring all of their domestic companies to gather secret information. And such information must be sent to the government upon their immediate request. 
so it's pretty much certain that backdoors are installed on all Huawei products, making it likely that the CCP will rarely actually have to ask for it all. And if you want proof of this, Huawei was even accused of hacking into the African Union's headquarters, a $200 million headquarters almost entirely funded by China. This became apparent in 2012, when information was allegedly sent from the building's data system to a recipient in China. But this wasn't just one incident, it reportedly kept going on for five years straight until discovered in 2017. During that time, the African Union scrambled to plug the leak and install new servers, refusing Chinese offers to have a look at their security measures. The French newspaper Le Monde released the news the following year, after security improvements had been made. But then suddenly, in a strange turn of events, the whole thing was denied by both the African Union and Huawei themselves. Perhaps certain allowances were made by officials in Africa in order to keep their new Chinese allies. The story ran by Le Monde was confirmed by evidence released by the Financial Times as well. So it wasn't just like these were baseless accusations at all. This became the first international incident that proved to the world how strong Huawei's grip on their technology was, and a prediction on how they'll use their infrastructure if given the chance. In fact, it's highly likely that Huawei monitors devices in first world countries much more closely, given that China has already made it clear that the West is their ideological enemy. And if you think that this is an exaggeration, this next point will be crucial to understand, because to see why Huawei is such a threat to the West, we need to see what they're doing today back in the mainland. These corporate documents show the grim realities of how Huawei's inventions have been used. In late 2021, a collection of presentations were leaked. It's unknown who they were meant for, but the sensitive information they had on China's surveillance the system implied that they were for government eyes only. The slides were first created in 2014, but were amended for up to six years afterwards. Many of them bear Huawei's logo, and they detail how the company created a one-person, one-file facial recognition system. They also included information about Huawei's work relating to voice analysis, a system which can identify people from just the sound of their voice by comparing it to the library of voice prints. And considering Huawei's control over both the phones and the infrastructure in China, it's unlikely that they haven't thought about making such a library. And all of these things that Huawei has developed are tied to the Xinjiang region in China, the same region that hosts the CCP's re-education centers for Uyghurs. Of course, they are mentioned by name and leak. The documents only discuss this technology's use in national security. But considering where the leak came from, it's obviously the surveillance technology is meant to spy on, the same innocent people that China considers a threat to national security, the people that China has been subjugating and oppressing for years. And with Huawei's help, the Chinese government has got a whole of new tools. In July of 2018, for example, Huawei filed for a new patent on a technology that can detect whether someone is ethnically Han or Uyghur. It's also likely that these technologies have already been implemented. And so with shady track records like this coming from Chinese tech companies, it's not hard to see why the US has recently decided to implement sanctions against Huawei, labeling the company as a military and economic threat. So the US cut off Huawei's ability to acquire American semiconductors, while also restricting Huawei from using American technology to make the semiconductors themselves. Despite Despite this, it hasn't stopped Huawei from trying to find a new way around the limitations. One of the main ways they've done this is by getting another Chinese tech startup called PXW to order semiconductor components with the hopes of starting their own manufacturing process. And coincidentally, a former Huawei executive just so happens to also be the one running PXW, meaning that the startup is pretty much only being used to get around US sanctions. And this has come to a head in the last couple of years, as Huawei has been one of the main players behind building 5G infrastructure. Now we've already talked about the takeover of Africa, but Huawei has infiltrated Western infrastructure as well. In the UK, for example, Huawei designed and made parts that have been used since 2003. Now, the UK was very slow to react to this, because back in the day, everyone believed that China was liberated, that they were becoming just another friendly country to the West, like Japan and South Korea. And it's only until very, very recently that people have started to realize the security implications of this. And at first, the government was reluctant to do anything about this, because Huawei had such leverage over the UK that it would be almost impossible to replace. They controlled almost all of the UK's telecommunication systems. The 40-page report is sharply critical of what they're calling long-standing security flaws. Critics of the company allege that Beijing could use its gear for spying. And if the public knew the true extent of how dangerous this was, there would be uproar. So the first step to deal with this Huawei problem was for the UK to propose a cap on Huawei of 35% of the infrastructure market. But this was actually met with resistance. The US were incredibly worried about the implications of Huawei's 5G infrastructure, and China's growing authoritarianism posed a very serious risk to the West. Because as we mentioned before, Huawei has a long history of leaving backdoors in their technology. That and their souring relations with China led them to put lots of pressure 
from the UK to oust Huawei. The UK even told Huawei that Trump himself was pressuring them to remove it. But because of how ingrained Huawei were into their network, a total removal just wasn't possible anymore. Lots of the parts they've added through the years were essential, and removing them would cause outages across the country if they were removed. Doing this during an economic crisis and an energy crisis, and the UK would fall apart. And so instead, the UK promised to remove all Huawei tech from its networks by 2027. A compromise that gives Huawei five more years to suck all their data from the country. But the US weren't so light on Huawei, they knew what was up. And so shortly before Trump's universal Huawei ban and the attempted ByteDance ban, the US government also released arrest warrants for many top executives at the company. At first this seemed just like an empty diplomatic escalation. But when Canadian police arrested the so-called princess of Huawei, Meng Wanzhou, the dispute suddenly got a whole lot more real. Real. Meng, as Huawei's CFO, had been implicated in making deals to supply the Iranian government with Huawei tech, despite the international sanctions on them. And so China quickly responded by arresting two American businessmen, although they insisted it was an unrelated matter. They were picked up by Chinese authorities days after Huawei CFO's Meng Wanzhou was arrested in Vancouver. All we know is that the two men were taken into custody on what they call suspicion of engaging in activities that endanger the national security of China. After a two-year stare down across the Pacific Ocean and a tense legal battle, Meng was released from custody after striking some sort of plea deal. She admitted to the crimes but wasn't charged and was allowed to return home. China then released their two hostages the next day, coincidentally. Although this standoff did end with a peaceful compromise, it wasn't a good sign of things to come. This sort of Cold War era hostage diplomacy shows how much the US government fears Huawei and the power they've given China, but it also more worryingly shows how little they can do about it. When they tried to do something about Huawei, they got nowhere. When the UK government tried to do anything about Huawei, they found it was almost impossible to get the leech off of them. All of this goes to show that sanctions and diplomacy don't really do a lot to prevent the whole problem with Huawei's influence. Even the outright bans on Huawei itself hasn't stopped them. They're like a cancer metastasizing over the body of the world, and the West was too late to react to Huawei in the same way they haven't reacted to other Chinese expansions. Because you see, Huawei is just one part of China's growing web of control. We haven't even mentioned TikTok or Tencent. And on top of their growing technological dominance, China has also established a network of outposts and harbors to safeguard their trade and interests. I mean, they're now buying up global ports. And China has also heavily invested in the foreign housing markets across the world. Instead of locally selling, businessmen are happy to let Chinese interests outbid them. Not to mention China buying up schools, films, and even governments. Any way they can, China has expanded their sphere of influence. And so 27 years away from its completion, and the 2049 does seem to be progressing well for China. And a huge part of this has all been thanks to Huawei. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more controversial videos that I can't release to the public, consider joining the channel. For just $5.99 a month, you'll have access to monthly exclusive videos not released to the public, where you can watch our videos on Ted Kaczynski and our Mr. Robot series review, and soon we'll be releasing a video on the man behind gay frogs. In addition to the exclusive videos, you'll also have access to my private Discord group. All you have to do is click the join button below or click the link in the description.